What's up? Scuzzy Eye here. In my previous video I covered bit depth, so uh, this time I figured do, I would do a complimentary video on sampling rate. So uh, I'm going to just cover the basic setup again here. Um, again I have the uh, master level set to minus 6 dB, not because I'm dealing with signals at or above clipping this time, but I'm still using some ra rather loud output so the recorded waveforms are larger on the display. Now over here I'm using Thor again. I have it set up as a record source. Um, one thing I didn't show last time, I had disconnected the right channel of Thor because it's generating a mono signal anyway, and it basically the recordings will have just a single waveform rather than uh, two matching waveforms for stereo. Um, I have it set to uh, mono so I can only play play one note at a time. Uh, no filter. Uh, setting the I have a square wave this time instead of a sine. And um, it's uh, pulse width set to 64 right in the middle. I have turned it up an octave. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, the uh, uh, amp is turned up all the way. The attack is down to almost nothing because I, square waves I don't care if they click because they're just basically a bunch of clicks right next to each other um, and the release is also very quick um, I believe that's all the settings I have in this one it's a pretty simple setup now over here in the sequencer I have three measures with 12 MIDI notes going from 116 to 127 this is the top octave uh, that combined with Thor being turned up an octave gives me a uh, top frequency of about 25 kilohertz, which is a kilohertz above Nyquist. So these last two notes are going to be uh, a real problem to be rendered at 48 kilohertz, the, uh, the current sampling rate that I'm using. So I'll just uh, play that through a couple of times so you can hear, hear, have a listen to how it sounds. And these high frequencies are a little hard to come through, but uh, I'll be showing you the waveforms anyway. Now, um, particular particular interest is the fourth note here, but I'll, if you listen to this one, that's pretty close to being how it should sound. There there are al aliasing artifacts, but this one, that just goes completely strange. That doesn't sound right at all. And then these last two are also of interest, and they're kind of difficult to hear here anyway. But uh, I will uh, create an audio track and set the uh, Thor as the record source. And uh, just just dump this to the track real quick. And uh, we'll go back to the beginning and zoom in here. So you get an idea what it. It's close to being right. I mean, there's still aliasing going on. You can see that. It, um, ideally, these should all have been exactly the same height. Um, if it was a uh, an actual representation of the waveform and not the recorded recorded bits these would be all exactly the same height and there'd be no other p pattern being imposed in here if you look at this uh, the fourth note here the one I pointed out sounded completely weird if you look at this there's a there's a, a secondary waveform is pretty much the aliasing artifact has pretty much taken over the overall waveform. I mean, there's, there's still the square wave in there, but there's this secondary waveform completely imposed over top of everything. And then these last two, which should be on both sides of it here, um, yeah, that's that's not right, and that's just they're both they're both completely not representative of what the what the signal should look like at all. They are um, this one it was just so so. Sh um, such a small amount below uh, Nyquist, and this one's actually above Nyquist. So the the representation the representation of the waveform is not correct. This is not not what it should have looked like at all. Um, these basically these two these two notes can't be represented at 48 kilohertz at the uh, frequency I'm operating at here. So I'm gonna um, uh, let's see how it's gonna stop. Go back to the beginning here. Um, I'm just gonna delete this track. So now, uh, contrary to what I had shown in the previous video, I'm actually going to bounce the mixer channels on this um, because unless you have an audio interface that's capable of operating at 192 kilohertz, 
there's no way to get 192 kilohertz audio in the reason because when you record a uh, record you set a device as, as a record source it gets recorded at the current operating rate so you'd actually have to have a piece of hardware that's operating at 192 which require quite a bit of CPU power in order to do that too so um, I'm going to bounce this at uh, 192. I'm going to, uh, I forgot the aux oh, for fader, so I can get a mono file. Um, you you can normalize or not. If you're if you're doing this for a final mix, um, you just want make sure there's no overs. Um, you you can normalize. Though if you normalize, everything's going to be probably a lot louder than what you know, what you how you had your mixer set up um, before you bounce the track. So, but it it gives you sort of a, a clean starting uh, starting point. I will normalize this. I'll just to show you what happens. So I bounce that out and uh, select this track and make sure it's at the beginning and import this audio here. Uh, this is the one I just bounced. And I'll go into the comp editor and re reduce the volume. So that's more about the level that was being played back so it doesn't completely blow your ears off. Uh, if you, I'm going to actually undo this here in a second. I want you to look at two things before I when, I... when I import this, watch at the last two notes here. Watch what happens. They disappear. They come in at first. That's what actually is happening during the, the calculate process. And that's what it says. It's uh, or, um, doing background calculations or loading samples. When you import audio into Reason, it, uh, the waveform shown at the rate that it was recorded, but then it gets resampled to the current operating, the, the current project uh, sampling rate. And uh, as I was saying about these last two notes, they were basically at and above Nyquist, so they really couldn't be represented in a 48 kilohertz file. So they, after it gets resampled down, it, the audio just doesn't, it can't be represented. It's gone. It's 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 not audible in at 48 kilohertz so it shouldn't be represented in the wave file um, let me get let me actually go back and do that uh, since I undid that I need to redo the minus 5 and uh, now let me play this for you so you can actually hear what this sh what the Thor playback should have sounded like it without the aliasing artifacts Now, and I'll play the, th play the Thor again. Some of the things you may notice during the Thor playback is the notes don't always sound like they're increasing, no notably the fourth note here. Um, it just, um, and it's completely out of step. But even, even as it's going up, you may hear a secondary tone coming down. The one thing about digital audio, uh, people always talk about wanting to run higher sampling rates and everything else, and which I'm demonstrating here at higher sampling rate, but this is really the only reason you need to go to a higher sampling rate is to avoid aliasing. The Nyquist theorem works. It says that a digital audio signal can be represented up to the Nyquist limit, which is half of the sampling rate. Anything below half the sampling rate can be perfectly recreated. But the problem is when you, if you do feed into a, an analog digital converter or any sort of sampling algorithm, a signal which contains frequencies at or above the Nyquist limit, they will alias and they will end up creating arti audible artifacts. So uh, really for playback, all you need is 44.1, 48 kilohertz. That will get you up to the human limit. But for, record for recording purposes, Higher is better, uh, especially if you don't have perfect analog filters for, for analog recording or oversampling and then uh, then resampling down to a lower rate, which is what happened when I imported the file here and these last two bits disappeared. Now I have even argued the point before that if you are doing your sound design with aliasing, then it's part of the sound. You may be expecting it. But as I was showing that some notes if you're if you're playing one note or a chord when you're doing your sound design, you may not notice the fact that as you go up in a scale, the alias artifacts come down, which can just be distracting or just sound odd. So that's one reason you may want to eliminate aliasing, even though it was part of your original sound design. Another thing is an instrument by itself when you're doing your sound design is one thing, but as you know, when you're bringing your mix together, you end up EQing and low pass, high pass filtering just to remove 
parts of the instrument sound that you don't need that are either conflicting with another instrument or just cluttering up your mix and aliasing artifacts are just that they're all clutter really if you can just get rid of them in the first place and not have to deal with them as part of your mix then it's just it opens up more space for other sounds I don't know if any built-in instruments in Reason uh, support oversampling. I don't believe that they do. So this is a way to get oversampling out of all the built-in instruments, or including all the rack extensions that don't include oversampling. And for those that do, while this is only 4x oversampling, it does have some additional benefits. The offline filter that's uh, that occurs when you're importing the audio into Reason is a lot more accurate and more powerful than anything that can, can be done in real time. A filter can have a lot better cutoff characteristics if it has access to more samples. Now, an instrument rendering in real time will only have access to the samples that it's already generated and held in a buffer. An offline filter has access to the entire audio stream all at once. It can look forward and backwards or however it needs to to see where the, where the signal has been and where it's going next. This yields a lot better cutoff characteristics. Now, I'll just show uh, one other way to, uh, to resample this just using Audacity instead. Of reason. So I've got Audacity running here. I will uh, open up the file. This is the same uh, bounced 24-bit audio file I have there. Um, it, it's uh, at 192 kilohertz, so it has all, all the way up, even the last two notes are being represented. Um, so I will use the resample feature in here to knock it down to 48, which like I said I'm using for my current project, and it does the same thing. It, it loses the top two notes just like just like in Reason, because they are at or above uh, 24 kilohertz, then the Nyquist limit of 48 kilohertz. I'll also reduce the overall level of this uh, to uh, just normalize it to minus 5, like I had done in Reason. I'll drop it down to a little more bearable level there. And export this. Again, I have my option set to a 32 bit float there. No, no metadata. So now if I go back into Reason, create an audio track, um, let's turn that off, and uh, import the audio into it. Go up a directory. This is where I saved the other one from inside Audacity. And oops, yeah, this one I actually had just undone something. Um, I'll go back in and set that to minus five. Uh, still a little bit hotter in reason, but this this is probably actually more I ideal than the setting here. So I'll solo this one and play it back. And really, not much difference from how how it was done in reason, but I was able to import it as 32-bit, which I could have could have left it uh, at the full volume there and turned it down in reason, or had would have had a lot of, a few other options. Well, I'd like to thank you for tuning in. Uh, until next time, I'm Scuzzy Eye, and thanks for watching.